Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Gut Academy. I'm Dr. William DiPaolo, and today we are going to take a deep dive, or we're going to start actually a series of videos that uh, have to do with the gut-brain axis, um, just because that I feel that this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in. It's a fairly new um, area that is just starting to gain a lot of momentum, and so it'd be good to go over some basic concepts to help understand what's hype and what is actually good science and to go over some concepts and um, some skills that you could use to use the microbiome and as a way to better your own health. So our, today we're going to jump right in and it's going to be a little bit of a talk more about the systems that are involved in this gut-brain axis and sort of some of the molecules that the gut produces that do influence this um, crosstalk between the central nervous system and the brain, uh, the gut. So our, our gut actually has 500 million neurons that connect it to the central nervous system. And so these 500 million neurons both signal from the brain to the gut and from the gut to the brain. So there's an incredible amount of um, communication going on there. And one thing that we do know is that there's a ton of microbiome of, of microorganisms that comprise the microbiome in that intestine. And so more than likely, they, they have an impact on some things that our central nervous system controls other than just the digestive process, such as emotional behavior, um, the potential to have an impact on uh, long-term chronic inflammatory neurological disorders like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, and even um, diseases or even um, conditions like autism, uh, where we are finding out more and more that the gut microbiome may have an impact on um, children or people that are, that are aut autistic. So it's a very interesting topic that opens up a lot of doorways, because if you think about it, if we find that the microbiome does have an influence on the, the central nervous system and can influence behavior and can influence your mood and can influence you know, the development of autism or symptoms with autism or your development of Alzheimer's or symptoms associated with Alzheimer's, then that means that the microbiome then becomes a therapeutic, a potential therapy that can be used to treat some of these symptoms. If we can identify specific bacteria that are... Um, contributing to the disease, or we can identify parts of the bacteria that can inhibit the disease. Um, either way, the microbiome will then be opened up as a potential therapeutic for some of these neurological conditions, as well as personality and, um, and uh, other disorders uh, like mood and depression, things like that. So, the central, so today we're going to talk about the different parts of the um, gut-brain connection, and we're going to start with the central nervous system. This is kind of like a no-brainer, and I didn't mean to say that as a pun, but it fits. Uh, the central nervous system is includes the brain and the spinal cord, and it is essential for integrating all the signals that are coming from all of the neurons in our body. It integrates those into movement, into a heartbeat, into breathing. So really, it's the center of our, our sort of bodies. We can't move around or exist without our brain and our spinal cord being functional. Uh, within the brain and the spinal cord uh, is a uh, an axis called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, this axis uh, this axis is actually close to my heart because I, my college thesis was on the, the HPA axis and sex hormones uh, way back in the day, and so I'm reliving some of those um, those uh, memories now as I talk about this, but. Um, the hypothalamus, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is basically, the, it controls stress. And so when your body is stressed, uh, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is activated so it can try to get the body under control so it doesn't go wonky and like you start having, you know, really racing heartbeats and, and you go into a sort of a panic or um, uncontrollable feelings and things like that. So the HPA axis is what's going to try to balance out and try to um, control that that response to stress um, and, and inflammation. So it's also induced when there's inflammation. So it's a very important axis that begins with the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus can be um, activated through um, adrenaline or epinephrine that's made in the periphery. And so this epinephrine or adrenaline will um, activate the hypothalamus. 
So that tells the brain immediately we're under stress. The hypothalamus will secrete something called corticotropin releasing factor, which goes to talk to the pituitary gland and activates the production of adrenocorticotropin releasing hormone or ACTH. And um, that ACTH then stimulates the adrenal glands which are little glands that sit on top of your kidneys and they produce cortisol. The cortisol is um, really associated with that stress response and if you ever had stress testing done or you went, went for a research study and they were looking at stress, you might have had your cortisol levels tested and so you can do that either through saliva or through blood and, and it's associated with the sort of how well you control your stress. and. Um, Cortisol has far-reaching effects. The, it's kind of um, blamed for, like chronic stress is associated with weight gain and, um, and weight and body fat and an increase in body fat. And cortisol also um, has immune suppressive properties as well. So there's a lot of things that cortisol does um, because if you're in a state of stress, that means your body needs to be using resources to control that stress and so you don't need certain things to be happening you want to store your fat so that you can get to it later uh, if you need it you want to be able to suppress your immune system because you have to use that energy to maybe flee so um, cortisol is one of the three hormones that is sort of considered the stress hormones which are vasopressin cortisol and epinephrine slash adrenaline so that's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis which exists within the central nervous system and, uh, and also in the kidneys. Um, the next system we'll talk about is the autonomic nervous system. This has two arms to it. It has the parasympathetic nervous system which is your rest and digest or your rest and ruminate sort of phenotype. So this is what happens to you after you eat your Thanksgiving dinner. You just want to sit there and you're just stuffed and you just want to rest so that your body can start digesting it and absorbing all the nutrients and energy that it can possibly get out of that. This is mediated by the vagal nerve, and the vagus nerve is the longest nerve in the body, or one of the longest nerves in the body, and it goes from the, in the GI tract up into the, the brain, and it is responsible for sending signals to the brain to say, hey, we just ate a lot of food, and so we need to rest and digest this food right now, so like just chill out. Um, the sympathetic arm of the nervous system is like, not going to have anything to do with resting and ruminating. It is the fight or flight mode of um, the autonomic nervous system. And so this is what, when you have danger, uh, somebody wants to steal your turkey leg off your plate. And so you go into fight or flight mode and your adrenaline kicks in. Your adrenaline will then actually function to inhibit the vagus, vagus nerve so it stops that vagus nerve from uh, stimulating the brain so basically it shuts off that signal so then the brain isn't receiving the, the signal that says hey we need to rest and digest instead it clears a pathway for these um, more um, activating sort of uh, hormones and neurotransmitters to to get through which is that fight or flight uh, mechanism so that would be your adrenaline and your norepinephrine. Um, that would be activating um, this response. It would activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and it would start a whole cascade of events. Lastly, uh, and the sympathetic nervous system is um, mediated through lower sort of um, nerves, like the splanchnik nerve uh, system, and that's in sort of the lower part of the spinal cord. The enteric nervous system is the last part that we'll talk about. And now this is the sort of, if you've ever um, felt butterflies in your stomach or had to go to the bathroom when you were really nervous or you had some fear, um, that's your enteric nervous system being activated. It is um, a nervous system that's really just in the gut and it can actually function without having to use the brain to tell it to digest or to tell it to really function. So it can do some of the digestive properties without having a signal from the central nervous system. That hence the name the second brain uh, because it doesn't need that first brain to perform some of its functions and so that's where the term the second brain comes from if you didn't know that that's um, sort of how that name came to be so in the, the enteric nervous system is quite complex and it's integrating a lot of signals from a lot of different parts of the colon and the small intestine 
and also different layers of the small intestine and the colon. If you cut the colon cross-sectionally, so you have these sort of circles, you'll see multiple layers. And each layer has some sort of function. So you'll see muscle layers. You'll see um, mucosa, mucosal layers. You'll see um, other sort of layers. And each one of these layers has its own specialized function. So the mucosa has a lot of immune cells in it. So there are a lot of immune cells in that mucosal layer that uh, function um, to remain tolerant to food antigens as well as remain tolerant to the gut microbiome. Um, the intestine is actually the largest immune organ in the body, so there's a lot of immune system in that tissue. And they have to receive signals from the central nervous system as well, and they'll also relay signals to the central nervous system through this enteric nervous system. So it's a very complicated, multi-layered, complex system that we're not going to get really too much into. What I did want to talk about, though, is how the products and um, some things from the gut microbiome can have a connection to the brain. And so uh, there's three different molecules we'll talk about today, short-chain fatty acids, neurotransmitters, and bile salts. Short-chain fatty acids, you probably heard me talk about a number of times. It seems like I'm always bringing them up. And I think that's because they are very important parts of the uh, products of the microbiome. Uh, it's also because when researchers go to study something, it's easier to study something where there's a tool already available than to make a tool that can tell you something about a molecule that you might not have as dramatic of an effect or might have more of a dramatic effect, but there's just no tools to measure it. So I guess my point here is that those short chain fatty acids are very important. There could be other molecules also out there that we just aren't measuring yet. Um, and that's one of the caveats of science. And one of the more interesting parts of that is the development of tools that can open up new doors and new pathways. But um, short chain fatty acids are very important molecules. They are produced through the fermentation of dietary fiber. Our bodies cannot digest fiber. We don't have the machinery to do that. So we rely on the gut bacteria in the colon to digest and ferment these carbohydrates and um, fiber. And in return, they produce pro propionate, acetate, butyrate, and a whole slew of other short chain fatty acids. But these are three are the most um, significant and the most well-researched. Um, propionate has a role in satiety. So it will help. It helps with that whole pathway where it makes you You've eaten so much and your body says, oh my God, I can't eat anymore, like we just have to stop. That's a satiated signal. Pro propionate has a role in that, that process. Butyrate has a role in the blood-brain barrier. So it can actually get out to the systemic parts of the body after it's produced by the gut bacteria. And we know that it has a role keeping the gut barrier nice and tight so things can't pass through. But it also has a role in keeping the blood-brain barrier tight so things can't pass into or out of the brain that aren't supposed to be there. The blood-brain barrier is, we have found out, is a little bit leaky, so some things can go through and it's not entirely a sterile, tight system, but it, it shouldn't be wide open and leaky and butyrate helps keep it more tight and prevents um, things from crossing into that blood, uh, crossing, uh, crossing uh, passing across the blood-brain barrier. I finally got it right the third time. Um, the second molecule I want to talk about is neurotransmitters. So you can't talk about the brain or the central nervous system without talking about neurotransmitters because these, in essence, are what how neurons communicate to each other. So if you think of an, uh, a signaling process as like a long train with different cars, and each car could represent a neuron, and you want to get a signal from one side of that train to the front of the train or from the front of the train to the back of the train. And so you have a person that's walking from car to car, and that could be your neurotransmitter. So basically, in between each neuron is a space, and that's the synapse, and that space is represented by the space in between the, the railroad cars. That synapse, so the neuron will secrete the neurotransmitters into that space. They'll, they'll drift across or diffuse across to the next neuron where they will bind a receptor, get taken in, and send a signal down through the next railroad car, and the process will repeat over and over again until it reaches the central nervous system or the organ the tissue that it's meant to be for. So um, neurotransmitters are very important at like communicating all sorts of things, uh, mood, behavior, um, muscle contraction, just 
a lot of things. And so there's two major neurotransmitters that we talk about when we talk about uh, the gut-brain connection. These are serotonin, which is the feel-good neuron. It's the one that you get when you are happy. It, it's going to make your day. And if you're depressed, then, or if you have depression, it's known that you have less of this uh, serotonin signaling in your body. And so to have lots of serotonin produced it would be a good thing because it could benefit your moods and, and make your day happier. Uh, gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA is related more towards that fear response. And so that's going to kick in with that fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system. So you'll find more GABA signaling there. And lastly, um, oh, and before I move on from that, it's pretty amazing that um, serotonin, which you would think of as a neurotransmitter that's made in the brain, and that like, that's because that's where all of our neurons are. But actually, 90% of the serotonin in our body is actually made by the gut bacteria, or the gut bacteria help to produce the serotonin, and so that's where the really the source of that that neurotransmitter is coming from. And there's certain bacteria that are better at producing serotonin than others, and um, that's because we. And we'll get into this in another video, but they can break down a precursor called tryptophan and turn that tryptophan into serotonin. So some bacteria are good at it and some bacteria are bad. And so you can understand how changing that ratio of the bacteria that can promote uh, serotonin would be beneficial to an individual. Lastly, we're going to talk about bile salts. Um, bile salts are also really important molecules that are Produced in the liver, they're secreted into bile ducts in the gallbladder and then released into the small intestine where they help your body absorb fats and fat-soluble vitamins. Um, the microbiome and bile salts have a complex sort of reciprocal relationship here. So bile salts are, um, are pretty um, toxic to some types of bacteria. So they're pretty harsh. They're acidic. And so certain types of bacteria can't live in that proximity to a lot of bile salts. And so um, particularly bacteria that are gram-positive, so those that are uh, found in the Firmicutes phylum, tend to not be as prominent in individuals who have high amounts of bile or bile acid production. And people who have high amounts of bile acid or bile acid production would be people who are omnivores, who eat a lot of animal proteins or animal fats. That really promotes uh, bile production. And so those people tend to have more bacteroides, and Prevotella compared to um, people who have uh, more, who eat less meat and have less bile salts in their, their intestine. So just through their, just through the way that they are, just through their physical properties, bile salts can influence the type of bacteria that are present in the gut. The microbiome can also influence the, the, um, the pool of bile salts that are available for fat absorption and uh, fat-soluble vitamin absorption. Um, and it, that's because certain bacteria have an enzyme called bile salt hydrolase that takes these bile salts and it can deconjugate them into a form that gets reabsorbed into the body so that it's a recycling sort of thing. And so if you have a lot of bacteria that have these bile salts, these bile salt hydrolases, then they're going to impact the different types of bile salts that are, are present than an individual who has less bacteria with those same um, bile salts hydrolases. So this is going to come into play down the line when we talk more about some of this signaling and, and, and um, bringing the liver into play a little bit. But for now, I just wanted to introduce these three very important molecules uh, so that uh, in future discussions you have a, basics, a basic knowledge of them. So that's going to be it for this sort of module of the gut-brain connection here at the Gut Academy. Um, we plan on doing future episodes. I want to do an episode on anxiety as somebody who suffers from great anxiety. Um, I think it's really interesting on learning how the gut bacteria can be used to modulate your anxiety response. Um, we'll do a section on neurotransmitters and serotonin, as well as um, some of the diseases that could be impacted by um, this gut-brain connection, like um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Um, we'll talk about moods and depression and also autism. So it should be a fun little mini-series that we're putting together here. So I'm, I'm excited to be that you're along for this journey. So until next time, thank you. I'm William DePaulo, and this is the Gut Academy.